The Gospel of Mark is probably the earliest account we have of the life of Jesus. It's certainly the shortest of the four Gospels. Mark never wastes time. It's a Gospel of action, and one of his favourite words is immediately. His opening words are these, the beginning of the Gospel, the good news, about Jesus Christ. There it is, straight to the point. Jesus is the Christ, and this is good news. He says nothing at all about the birth of Jesus, for Mark, it all starts at the River Jordan. He tells us about John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ and the baptism of Jesus in the river. He briefly mentions the temptation in the wilderness and then goes straight into the ministry of Jesus in the region of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake, and at that time there were small towns in places around the shore. Fishermen used casting nets at the water's edge, or went out at night in small boats. One of them was a fisherman named Simon, the man we know as Peter. He had a brother named Andrew. Fishing was a family business. One day, Mark says, the brothers were using a casting net near the lakeside when Jesus came. Come, follow me, Jesus said. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. At once, Peter and Andrew left their nets and followed him. Like Jesus, these men were Jewish and on Saturday they went to the synagogue to pray and listen to the reading of scripture. The preacher on this day was Jesus and his words had an authority they had never heard in other teachers. But as he spoke, there was a commotion in the congregation. It was a man who was possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He started to cry out and shout against Jesus. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come here to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked the spirit. Be quiet and come out of it. The people were confused. What is this, they said? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. That evening at Peter's house in Capernaum, people gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. And so it goes on one miracle after another. The miracles of Jesus showed that God was active and present with his people, and he wanted to heal them in more ways than one. That is good news. The deliverance of the demonized man and the healing of the people at Peter's door are in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark and happened in the town of Capernaum beside the Lake of Galilee. In Capernaum, we can still see the remains of an ancient synagogue. This building is much later than the time of Jesus. But below the walls of pale limestone, there are earlier foundations of black basalt. And these may be from the synagogue where Jesus preached. Open Mark chapter 5, and you read about a man named Jairus, who was one of the chief men in the synagogue. Jairus came to Jesus. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. There was also a woman in Capernaum who suffered from bleeding, not just once a month, but all the time. In Jewish religious law, this made her unclean. Even someone she happened to touch also became unclean. Jesus could heal her. But how could he touch her? Perhaps if she just touched the hem of his cloak, no one would know. But Jesus felt that power had gone out of him. Who touched my clothes, he said. The disciples did not understand. 
You see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask who touched me? The woman came forward and told him the whole truth. Daughter, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. For the woman, it was wonderful. But for Jairus, the delay was serious. Just then he got the news. His daughter, his little girl, was dead. It was too late. If only they had not stopped. But Jesus would not be put off. Don't be afraid. Just believe. A few moments later, Jairus could see for himself his daughter was dead. But Jesus spoke to the body as if she could hear him. Talitha, whom? Little girl, I say to you, get up. Someone who could break the power of death was good news indeed. The text of the Gospel does not say who wrote it. The name which has always been given to it is the Gospel of Mark. But who was the real source behind all this? We know from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, that Mark was also a close companion of the Apostle Peter. And the early Christians said that Mark was linked to Peter in writing about Jesus. Early in the second century, Papias, the bishop of Hierapolis in Phrygia, wrote about the Gospels and was quoted by the historian Eusebius in the fourth century. Mark, he says, was Peter's interpreter and wrote down accurately everything he remembered, whether of the sayings or doings of the Lord, but not in order. He paid attention to one thing, to leave out none of the things he had heard and to make no false statements in any of them. It's a dynamic, active picture of Jesus, preaching and healing the sick. It's a gospel of colorful description, like the report of a person with a quick eye for details. Mark, more than any other gospel writer, describes the emotions of Jesus. And according to Papias, the source of all those little details of time and place and action, the things that make Mark's description so vivid and real, come from the Apostle Peter, Simon Peter, up close and personal with Jesus for three and a half years. This does not mean that Peter wrote the Gospel, but rather the telling of the story of Jesus, which Mark had heard from Peter so many times, was what he put in writing. So the early Christians mentioned Peter, but they called it the Gospel of Mark. And where was Mark when he wrote his Gospel? Almost certainly in Rome. So the first readers would have included both Jewish and Gentile Christians living in the capital city of the empire. Open Mark chapter 8, and Jesus takes his disciples north to Caesarea Philippi. Here, below the cliff, came water which merged with other streams to make the River Jordan. Most people who lived in this area were not Jewish. They worshipped other gods, and some of them seemed to think that the huge cave was the gate of hell. The niches in the cliff face were for idols. The ruins in front are the remains of pagan temples, including one dedicated to Augustus and Rome. Here, the disciples were confronted by the spiritual needs of a pagan world. Jesus asked them a question. Who do people say I am? Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he said. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Messiah. This was a critical moment for Jesus and for the disciples, especially Peter. Jesus began to explain that he must suffer and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and be killed 
and after three days rise again. The Gospel of Mark changes from the power Jesus shows in his miracles and from the crowds in Galilee to the suffering of the Messiah and his little group of disciples. The word Messiah comes from an ancient Hebrew word meaning anointed. In Old Testament times, the kings in Jerusalem were, of course, political and military leaders, but they were also anointed with olive oil as a symbol of God's blessing. If they were obedient to God's word, they had the privilege of leading the people in the way God had chosen. A king like this, not just crowned, but also anointed and blessed and serving God, could bring freedom and justice for all. So when God promised to send a saviour, it was natural and right to call him the Messiah, the Anointed One. The Greek word which expresses the same meaning is Christos, Christ. It also has the implication that the Messiah is a king. At this time, the Jewish nation was occupied by a foreign power, the Romans. And the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, had a reputation for brutality. Many years earlier, when Jesus was still a child, Jewish nationalists had rebelled, but it was hopeless. The Roman army marched in from Syria. Many of the Jews fought bravely, but they were slaughtered. The Romans were back in control. Two thousand Jewish men were crucified. In Jewish thinking at that time, if the Messiah was to be a king, surely he must first fight the Romans and destroy their power. But Jesus was saying he had come to die. And Mark is going to describe a very different Messiah from the one they expected. When Jesus spoke about himself, the title he used mostly was the Son of Man. This title for the Christ, the Son of Man, comes from the Old Testament, from Daniel chapter 7. There before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. In Mark 10, verse 33, Jesus said, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later he will rise. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of Mark does not seem to have the same kind of architectural structure that we find in Matthew. But it does have shape. And the most obvious way to understand the content of the book is with geography. He starts in Judea with the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan and the temptation in the desert. Then a large part of the Gospel covers the ministry of Jesus in the region of Galilee, focusing on the miracles and the authority of Jesus over sickness, demonic power, the forces of nature, and even death. Some scholars divide this into three phases we may call early, later, and final phases in the Galilee region. Then Jesus takes his disciples north to Caesarea Philippi, and we hear the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Messiah. From that moment, Jesus starts to travel south, back to Galilee, across the Jordan, down to Jericho, then up to Jerusalem. The last phase of ministry is in Jerusalem and is characterized by escalating confrontation with the official religious leaders, priests, Pharisees, religious lawyers, and elders. Finally comes the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. 
These last events happened in a very short time, but they are central in importance. This is what the Son of Man came to do. It is the heart of Mark's Gospel. One of Mark's chief concerns is discipleship. When Jesus spoke of himself in Mark 10 as the Son of Man coming to serve others and die as a ransom, the context comes right after Jesus has been confronted by a rich young man. In the culture of the Middle East, it was unusual for a rich man to run like this. But some things are more important than what people think about your dignity. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Gently, Jesus reminded him that no one can be good enough to earn eternal life. The young man was thinking about things he could do, rules he could keep. You know the commandments, said Jesus. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Uh, one thing you lack, said Jesus. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Selling everything he had and giving it to the poor would not have given the man eternal life, of course not. But the command to do it showed him his real problem. The most important thing for this man was not obeying God or following Jesus. It was money. Open Mark 14, and you find that Jesus has come to Jerusalem to celebrate the religious feast of the Passover. And he's staying just outside the city in the village of Bethany. On the first day of the feast, Jesus gave instructions to two of his disciples to go into the city of Jerusalem and make preparations for him to eat the Passover meal. A man carrying a jar of water will meet you, Jesus told them. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Mark makes the arrangement sound rather secretive, and it was. Already Jesus knew one of his followers had betrayed him, and he also knew that this meal was very important. It must not be interrupted. So even the disciples did not know where it would be. Was this the house of John Mark's mother? We don't know. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks. The traditional words at this time are, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. But this time Jesus said something new and shocking. Take it. This is my body. The unleavened bread of the Passover was in commemoration of that moment in the Old Testament when God had delivered their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. But Jesus was telling his disciples that from now on, this also meant something more. A new Passover in remembrance of Jesus and what he had done for them. By ancient Jewish tradition, the Passover also included a cup of blessing. Again, Jesus followed the ancient custom, and again he gave it new meaning. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. The disciples had known from the time they met him that Jesus was a great prophet. Later they had come to see that he was the Messiah, the Christ anointed by God and sent into the world. They had seen him heal the sick by the power of God. He had made the deaf to hear, the blind to see, the lame to walk. But now Jesus was speaking of himself as a sacrifice. 
his body broken like bread, his blood shed to create a new covenant, a new binding relationship with God. All he had said about the Son of Man was leading to this, and it would cost him his life. But in the future, there was still the promise of the kingdom of God. They left the room and went to a place named Gethsemane. The name means a press for making olive oil, and an orchard of olive trees is still there today. That night, Jesus took Peter, James and John to Gethsemane and asked them to keep watch. He began to pray. Mark says that Jesus was deeply distressed and troubled. Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus went back to pray. A second time the disciples fell asleep, and again a third time. The priests and elders in Jerusalem, who should have supported Jesus, had come to hate him. Jesus was too radical. They had gathered a crowd with weapons, and they were on their way to arrest him. In Mark 14, 53, Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin, the supreme court in Jerusalem, with the high priest as his president. He was on trial for blasphemy. The high priest called for witnesses, and these were brought into the court. If the council did not find clear evidence against Jesus, then according to Jewish law, he must be acquitted. The witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other, and Jesus remained silent. This could go on and on, and time was slipping away. The council seemed uncertain of what to do next. The high priest had one more option, to put Jesus under oath and ask him directly, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? The penalty for blasphemy is death. While Jesus was being tried by the Sanhedrin, Peter was outside in the courtyard. A servant girl of the high priest came by. You also were with that Nazarene, Jesus? Peter denied it. I don't understand what you're talking about. Early in the morning, the priests and elders and the religious lawyers took Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. He alone had the power to execute Jesus by crucifixion. Pilate saw that he was being used as a political tool by the priests, and he did not appreciate it. But when some pressure was applied, he did the politically convenient thing and sentenced Jesus to death. In ancient Rome, when the famous prosecutor Cicero spoke to members of the Senate, he called crucifixion that cruel and a disgusting penalty. What can it be called to crucify, said Cicero? No adequate word exists for such a horrible thing. Nothing has the power to describe it. In several places near Jerusalem, archaeologists have discovered stone burial boxes from the first century. And inside one of them were the bones of a crucified man. The iron nail in one of the feet had been driven through the heel and is still there today. The Gospel of Mark, usually vivid in detail, seems restrained by the horror of the cross. 
In Mark 15, 24, he simply states the awful fact. And they crucified him. The execution squad of soldiers divided up the clothes of Jesus and they cast lots to see what each of them would get. Taking the clothes of an executed criminal was a normal way of getting a bonus for their work. They also crucified two other men. After several hours, Jesus died. And now Mark introduces Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court. He wanted to help. Because Jesus had been executed by crucifixion as a criminal, he could not legally be buried in a family tomb. Joseph must go personally to the Roman governor and ask for the body. Pilate knew very well why the Sanhedrin had condemned Jesus, and when a centurion was able to confirm the fact that Jesus was dead, he agreed for Joseph to take the body. Joseph's tomb had never been used, so it was not a family vault, and he left the corpse in the place he had prepared for his own body. There was nothing left to do. It was all over. On Saturday, the Sabbath, no activity was permitted by Jewish law. But on Sunday morning, some of the women who were followers of Jesus went to the tomb. They wanted to anoint the body, and they wondered who would move the big stone to let them in. To their amazement, the stone had already been rolled away. So they went in. Inside the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of Man, and his resurrection changes everything. It changes our lives. Death is not the end. This life is only part of a bigger picture. What we have to do is to open our lives to him, to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. And what better way to start than by opening the Gospel of Mark? Read it today.